Hi, I'm Dr. Mark McAllister, the professor. As always, joined by my good buddy and assistant, Bones. All right, get off me. Today, the two of us will be taking you through the dissection of the midgut and hindgut viscera, as well as the associated vasculature. The midgut begins at the level of the entry of the common bile duct and pancreatic duct into the duodenum, and then ends at approximately the splenic flexure of the large intestine. The hindgut then begins at that point and continues down to the majority of the uh, rectum. You'll want to review the small and large intestines, their features, their relationships, as well as the relevant peritoneal formations, mesenteries and such before you begin this dissection. As always, you want to release any intra-abdominal adhesions as you progress through the dissection if you haven't done this already. Again, if you need help with this, get some assistance from your instructor. Your first step will be to identify the duodeno-jejunal junction at the ligament of trites, an extension of the right cruse of the diaphragm that suspends this junction in the left upper quadrant. This marks the beginning of the jejunum, and from that point you'll want to run the small bowel from ligament of trites to the ileocecal junction. Running simply entails passing the small bowel through your hands and appreciating its length, its attachment to the posterior abdominal wall, and the course that the small bowel takes to the uh, mid-region of the abdominal cavity. Make sure that you uh, review the differences between the jejunum and ileum. We'll walk through these after we complete our vascular dissection. Once you've run the small bowel, Try and gather it all up into your hands and appreciate the mesentery to which the small bowel attaches to the posterior abdominal wall. Note the oblique nature of the small bowel mesentery beginning in the left upper quadrant and extending down to the right lower quadrant. And recall what that double fold of peritoneum contains, namely the superior mesenteric artery and its branches, as well as the superior mesenteric vein and its tributaries autonomics, and lymphatics. Once you've run the small bowel and appreciated the mesentery, move down to the right lower quadrant and identify the blind-ended pouch that marks the beginning of the large intestine. This will be the cecum. On the cecum, identify the condensed longitudinal bands of smooth muscle known as the tinea coli, and you can follow these retrograde to identify the appendix if the appendix is present. The appendix is attached to the base of the cecum and the three tinea coli all converge at the appendix. It's a good way to find it. Next, follow the uh, large intestine around and identify its right or ascending portion, its transverse portion, its left or descending portion, and then the mobile sigmoid portion in the left lower quadrant. Make sure you take a look at the external features of the large intestine, the sacculations or hostra that are created by the uh, tinea coli, the fat tags or epiploic appendages, as well as the uh, mobility of the transverse and sigmoid colons as their mesentery is loosely attached to the posterior abdominal wall. You'll then, as a final step, want to carefully mobilize the right and left colons away from the posterior abdominal wall by getting into that embryologic plane between their mesenteries and, and the posterior wall itself. Remember, the right and left colons are secondarily retroperitoneal structures, which means their mesenteries fuse with the posterior abdominal wall during embryologic development. This fusion plane can be reopened quite easily by incising the peritoneum along what we call the white line of Tolt. Um, the right and left colons can then be bluntly mobilized towards the midline, but you want to be careful that you don't take the ureters, the gonadal vessels, or even the kidneys with you as you mobilize these structures towards the midline. We'll demonstrate how to do this as we move to the cadaver now and we walk you through these steps. Okay, so we're back to the uh, cadaver inside the abdominal cavity. 
Uh, this episode will be looking at the midgut and hindgut structures as well as the vascular supply to those. Good place to start again is, is to identify the greater omentum, which is a quadruple fold of peritoneum derived, two layers deriving from the stomach and the other two layers deriving from the transverse colon, which you can see right, right here. All four layers come together to form this fatty apron-like tissue known as the greater omentum or more specifically the gastrocolic ligament portion of the, the greater omentum. So to explore the midgut, we want to elevate that up. And first thing you want to look for is the uh, duodeno-jejunal junction, um, which remember we identified the four parts of the, the duodenum. This is going to be in the epigastric region, just slightly to the left of the, the midline. And right here, uh, we see the duodeno-jejunal junction right, right here. If you reflect the initial part of the ju jejunum away, you can see a fold of peritoneum that suspends that angle right there. That's known as the ligament of trites, and that's the anatomical marker between the fourth part of the duodenum and the beginning of the jejunum. So this here is the, the you see this fold of, of peritoneum, that's the ligament of, of trites. So that marks the beginning of the, the jejunum. It's a good idea at this point to, as we say, run the, the small bowel, um, which basically means palpating it, uh, sliding it through your fingers throughout its entire uh, length, just so you can get a feel for the length and breadth of the, the small bowel. See what's tethering the small intestine to the posterior abdominal wall, this is the mesentery of the small bowel or what um, in clinical terms we refer to simply as the mesentery. There are several mesenteries in the abdominal cavity, but this is the mesentery as it's often referred to, the mesentery of the small bowel. <clears throat> There's no distinct transition between jejunum and ileum, but more or less the jejunum um, occupies the initial two-fifths of the small intestine after the duodenum and the ileum comprises the latter three-fifths. But there is no distinct um, transition point. At the end of the, the dissection today, we'll um, show you some of the more subtle features that will help you distinguish between the jejunum and the, and the ileum. But as I've run the, the small bowel, I've now reached the iliocolic junction. And right here is the, sorry, the ileocecal junction. Right here is the cecum, the blind-ended pouch that marks the beginning of the, the large intestine. Remember, the small intestine is not called small because of its length. It's called small because of its small diameter relative to the large diameter of the, the large intestine. So as we've run the, the small bowel, we've um, run through approximately four uh, to five feet. And when I displace all that small bowel um, in the mid portion of the abdominal cavity and try and gather it all up in my hands, and you should do this so that you can appreciate the small bowel mesentery and its orientation. You can see it begins up here in the left upper quadrant and then extends obliquely down towards the ileocecal junction in the right, right lower quadrant. You can sort of swing the, the small bowel back and forth on its mesentery, and you can kind of get an idea of the orientation of that root of the root of the mesentery. Within this fold of peritoneum lies the vascular supply to the small bowel, um, largely superior mesenteric artery, as well as the venous drainage, autonomic supply, and lymphatic drainage of the, the small intestine. So it's a good idea to grab the entire small bowel, gather it up, and kind of tilt it back and forth on its mesentery so that you can appreciate the oblique uh, directionality of that root of the mesentery as we call it, or its attachment to the, the posterior abdominal wall. Just for reference purposes, faintly here behind the mesentery, you can see the uh, abdominal aorta. Uh, we'll be looking at that more closely 
um, and we get to the posterior abdominal wall dissection. So just some of the, the differences we'll point out initially, if you look at the, the jejunum, again, here's our ligament of trites right here. So we're very proximal in the jejunum. And you look at the margin between the mesentery and the, the wall of the small intestine, you see how it's very sharp. It's a very distinct margin between the fat of the, the mesentery and the small bowel uh, wall. Also, you can feel that the wall of the jejunum is slightly thicker. So if we go down towards the ileocecal junction, we look at what, what is ilium, and you look at that same margin, you see how it's indistinct, and how the, the fat of the mesentery sort of creeps on to the surface of the small bowel. We call this creeping fat. And this is one of the um, subtle differences that will help you distinguish between ilium, which I have in my hand, and jejunum that we showed earlier. The creeping fat is present on the uh, ilium, but not the jejunum. And there are some other differences that we'll point out uh, later on, but that's one of the initial things that you can look at to help distinguish between the more proximal jejunum and the more distal ilium. So once you've run the, the small bowel and you've taken a look at its mesentery and you've taken a look at some of the, the more subtle distinguishing features, we'll then come back to our cecum down here in the, the right lower quadrant. The cecum is the widest or great largest diameter portion of the large intestine and it begins as a blind ended sac. We see here with the small bowel contents empty into through the ileocecal valve which you can uh, palpate. It may be difficult to uh, demonstrate on camera but you want to look for the tinea coli. If we can come in real close right in here and if we'll be able to appreciate it or not, but this longitudinal band you see here of smooth, smooth muscle. It's one of the, the three tinea coli of the, the colon. The longitudinal layer of small, of uh, smooth muscle is condensed down into three, three bands. And those three bands are known as the, the tinea coli. There are two on the anti-mesenteric surface and the third one lies on the mesenteric surface and it's hidden by the the mesentery of the, the large intestine. So if we follow one of those tinea coli towards the, the cecum onto its base, it's kind of subtle, but I'm following it right here, that should take us to the appendix, which unfortunately in this cadaver uh, is lacking an appendix. But if I follow those three tinea, of the two that I can see, they converge at the base of the, the cecum and that's where the appendix would be normally be located and that's a good way to, to help find it. Um, this uh, particular specimen has had their appendix removed apparently, but it would be a um, sort of worm-like structure unless this is it hidden here in the mesentery, but I don't think so. No, uh, but you can feel a, a, har a slightly subtle lump there that uh, likely represents the stump of the uh, uh, appendix. If your cadaver does have an appendix, it will oftentimes be flipped up behind the cecum, like my fingers demonstrating. Most of the time, about 67% of the time, the appendix is retrocecal in location. Um, in other words, folded back behind the, the cecum. So if you don't see it initially, make sure you elevate the cecum up and look on its posterior surface. Um, that's where the appendix typically, typically lies. So from the, the cecum, which you, you see is somewhat mobile in this cadaver, if we follow the, the large intestine up, we can appreciate some of its uh, unique features. One of those features not present on the small intestine are these large fat tags that you see here coming off the surface of the, the large, large intestine. You don't have these on the small intestine. These fat tags, <clears throat> let's see if we can find some more here on the transverse portion. 
there's a very large fat tag you see here hanging off the surface of the, the transverse portion. Those are known as the epiploic appendages. They're one of the unique features of the large intestine. Another feature, um, again, kind of difficult to, to demonstrate, but the sacculated appearance. You can see one of those sacculations right here. These are known as hostra. Um, those hostra are created by, again, the tinea coli, one of which you can see very well right here, this longitudinal band of smooth muscle um, condenses in sections and creates this sacculated appearance of the, the large intestine that are uh, known as the, the hostra. As we uh, follow the ascending or the right colon up, uh, you can appreciate that it's fixed to the, the posterior abdominal wall. You can't lift it up like we did the, the cecum down here. The right colon as well as the left colon are secondarily retroperitoneal, uh, which means they initially develop inside the peritoneal cavity and, and acquire a coating of peritoneum, but then become compressed against the posterior abdominal wall during development so that only their anterior surface remains covered in, in peritoneum. They become secondarily retroperitoneal. But because of that secondary nature of, of positioning, these structures can be mobilized back into the, the peritoneal cavity. And we'll do that um, in just a little bit. So as we swing around, the uh, right colon then makes a curve. This is known as the hepatic flexure. And the, you can see a little bit of the flexure right here where the right colon starts to make a, a bend and now becomes transverse. You can back up just a touch here. You can see the a lot of the surface here is covered by these epiploic appendages, but you can certainly feel that the, the colon now goes transversely across the abdominal cavity. You can see some of the colon wall here. Uh, the transverse colon is now again mobile, um, and it's attached to the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery, of course, that mesentery is known as the transverse mesocolon. In our previous dissection, we created a bit of an opening in the transverse mesocolon to get into the lesser sac, but here's our, uh, what remains of our transverse mesocolon. And within that free edge, uh, you can palpate the middle colic artery, which we'll, we'll expose uh, later, a branch of the superior mesenteric artery that supplies the transverse colon, the middle colic vessels are, are right there. So this window in the transverse mesocolon was created in our uh, previous dissection of the, the foregut. So as we come around now, you can see the transverse colon making a second turn. This is the splenic flexure uh, because it occurs in the vicinity of the, the spleen and this portion of the colon is often attached to the, the spleen and will have to be um, uh, dissected off, off of it. Now we can see, again, covered in these epiploic appendages, but now we see the descending or the left colon here descending down the left side of the abdominal cavity. And again, it's fixed uh, to the posterior abdominal wall. Um, just like the right colon, the left colon is secondarily retroperitoneal, but again, can be mobilized um, which we'll perform here in a little bit. As we now swing down towards the pelvis, again, here's our uh, descending colon that now again becomes mobile. And you can see the, the sort of curved nature of the, the colon at this point, this S-shaped curvature that the colon takes in its mobile portion is now the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is mobile again because it has a, a mesentery. Um, this time that mesentery is known as the sigmoid mesocolon. And you can see that mesentery where it attaches just superficial to the 
um, external iliac vessels. You can see the external iliac artery right there that we had exposed during our, our inguinal dissection. So the, the sigmoid colon is mobile and quite floppy on a, a mesentery, sometimes too floppy, and that a long sigmoid mesocolon can actually allow the sigmoid colon to twist on itself in a condition we call sigmoid volvulus, where that portion of the, the colon becomes obstructed, uh, very, very distended with air, and, and can potentially rupture. So a long, floppy, um, sigmoid mesocolon can predispose to a twisting of the colon on its mesentery. That condition is known as a, a sigmoid volvulus. Now, as we follow the, the sigmoid, we can now see that it drops down into the, the pelvic cavity. Uh, it will transition into the rectum at this point. Um, one thing to note about the that transition right here and on the anti-mesenteric surface of the sigmoid, we can see the tinea coli quite distinctly. As you get a little bit farther down, those tinea will splay out. That condensation of longitudinal smooth muscle will splay out and become circumferential around the diameter of the, the rectum. That's one of the um, external signs of, of that transition point. We're not going to dissect the, the rectum today. We'll leave that for our dissection of the pelvis uh, down, down the road. But one of the uh, telltale signs that um, you're at rectum is, is the disappearance of the, the tinea coli and they're splaying out and becoming circumferential uh, again. Also, it's worth noting if you compare the um, diameters of the of our cecum here which is several centimeters in diameter four or five centimeters in diameter compared to the diameter of our sigmoid colon I've got them side by side here you can see how much narrower the sigmoid colon is compared to, to the cecum the large intestine progressively decreases in diameter as you go around its, uh, go through its, its various parts. And the sigmoid has the narrowest diameter of the, of the entire colon, which as a consequence of that <clears throat> raises its intraluminal pressure. And sometimes that high intraluminal pressure causes outpouchings of the wall of the sigmoid colon. That's a very common condition, particularly in Western countries known as diverticulosis. And um, most um, adults over the age of 60 in the United States have some degree of diverticulosis. These small little pouches that you see right here are um, small diverticuli. And we could open one up, but they're very thin walled and we would risk the, run the risk of spilling fecal contents into our dissection field. So I'm not going to uh, try and, and, and dissect any of those. But diverticular disease is quite common in the Western world and often um, blamed on the, the fact that uh, we tend to follow a low fiber diet in this country. But the fact that the sigmoid colon has the narrowest diameter and therefore the highest intraluminal pressure predisposes that area to the development of diverticulosis. So before we begin the um, vascular dissection, again, let, let's review the boundaries of the midgut and, and foregut, our, um, and, and hindgut. Our um, foregut structures, again, included the stomach, uh, the first two parts of the duodenum up to the, uh, where the common bile duct and pancreatic duct entered at, at D2, or the, the C-shaped uh, portion of the duodenum that curves around the, the head of the pancreas. We saw that, that earlier up here in this bile-stained area we were working in, in in our last episode. Beyond that entry of the common bile duct begins the midgut. And the midgut extends from the entry of the common bile duct. It includes the entire small intestine the remainder of the duodenum, the entire jejunum, ileum, and about two-thirds of the large intestine. 
So the cecum, the right or ascending colon, and the transverse colon about to the area of the splenic flexure. And that's where the um, midgut becomes hindgut. <clears throat> All that um, area is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. So second half of the duodenum roughly, the entire small intestine, jejunum and ileum, and the proximal two-thirds of the, the large intestine are all uh, perfused by the superior mesenteric artery and drained by the superior mesenteric vein. Distal to the splenic flexure, we uh, enter the hindgut, which is now inferior mesenteric artery distribution. Um, from roughly splenic flexure down to the proximal half or so of the rectum is the IMA distribution. <clears throat> the last vessel of the IMA is the superior rectal artery that we'll see a little bit later on. Beyond the superior rectal distribution um, begins the, inf the middle and inferior rectal distribution, uh, which are based off of the um, iliac vessels in the, in the pelvis. So before we begin the, the vascular portion of, of our dissection, we first want to mobilize both the right and the left uh, colons so that we can pull them up into the peritoneal cavity and expose their mesenteries that will facilitate the uh, exposure of their, their vascular supply. So you have to be very careful when, when you do this. Um, as I sort of lift up on the, the right colon, you can see it tenses the, the peritoneal attachment here to the lateral aspect of the, the abdominal cavity. You want to look for a very subtle, and sometimes you can't even see it, but a very subtle line. Um, you can see just a little bit of it right in here, this subtle, faint white line. That's known as the white line of Tolt, and that marks the um, attachment point of the, um, in this case, right colon to the, the peritoneum, to the retroperitoneum. Um, just about a millimeter inside of that, that line, you want to begin just in, incising just the peritoneum. And it, it's only a less than a millimeter thick. And if you're, if you're in the, the right plane, you should get into some very cobweb looking um, tissue and at that point you can just bluntly pull up on the in this case again right colon and if you see that sort of cobweb looking tissue in there you know you're in the right the right plane um, it should be very easy to to mobilize this up with just a little bit of sharp assistance here and seeing that retroperitoneal fat is a great sign that you're in the, in the right plane. You can continue to sort of push the fat down and elevate the uh, colon upwards. See, with just a, a little bit of work, now my right colon is now mobile, whereas before it was fixed to the, the posterior uh, abdominal wall. I'm continue to mobilize this up just a bit more until we get to our mobile transverse colon, which as we pointed out has its free uh, mobile mesentery. You definitely don't want to get too deep with this because you can inadvertently get into the ureters or in the case of a male the gonadal uh, vessels as well so it's very important that you do this in the the right plane you see that the mobility now granted on the granted to the right colon as we've mobilized it and you can see it's still attached to the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery that's the mesentery of the right colon that had become secondarily fused to the posterior abdominal wall during development We've just simply opened that embryologic plane and mobilized the, the right colon on its mesentery. I'm going to come around now to the left side and do the same step. We're going to mobilize the left colon. I'm going to push the small bowel here over to the right. 
You see our left colon is somewhat fixed to the posterior abdominal wall. There's that subtle white line of tolt right there. It can be very, very uh, subtle, but I'm gonna incise just peritoneum about a millimeter inside that and start looking for that fine retroperitoneal fat. If you feel the kidney trying to come up with the colon, you're obviously too deep. So reassess where, where you are. Make sure that you don't bring the kidney up with you in the retroperitoneal fat. Just incising a little more of the peritoneum. You can see the left colon has come up here quite nicely, now very mobile on its mesentery. Just a little bit more to do here at the splenic flexure. And we've very nicely mobilized the left colon as well. Once you've completed your look at the midgut and hindgut viscera, it's time to begin work on the vasculature. Where the midgut artery is the superior mesenteric artery, and this is quite an impressive artery with a massive distribution. So you wanna make sure you review that artery prior to this dissection, as well as its distribution to the midgut structures. We'll be looking to identify the inferior pancreatico-duodenal branch, the middle colic branch, the right and iliocolic branches, which may come off of a common trunk, and then the many jejunal and ileal branches that supply the uh, majority of the small intestine. On the cadaver, your first step will be to try and identify the origin of the SMA as it originates from the anterior aspect of the abdominal aorta. This can be difficult to find because it lies deep to the neck of the pancreas, and it's only about a centimeter or so uh, distal to or inferior to the origin of the celiac axis. Make an effort to, to find it because very close to that origin will be our first branch, the inferior pancreatico-duodenal. This is, tends to be a very small branch, but it does begin supplying the midgut at the second portion of the duodenum and also sends branches to the inferior aspect of the head of the pancreas as well as the neck of the pancreas. As you move down the main trunk of the superior mesenteric artery, just like with the celiac axis, you'll have to clean away an autonomic coat to appreciate the art artery itself. Fairly soon, you'll encounter the middle colic artery, which is somewhat counterintuitive because the transverse colon lies at the distal aspect of the midgut. However, because of the, the geometry of the artery, that branch comes off fairly early in the course of the SMA. It's also somewhat awkward because with the transverse colon retracted upward, the middle colic artery will ascend through the transverse mesocolon to reach its target. So look for this artery early as you're identifying the uh, proximal aspect of the SMA. On the right side of the artery, then typically you'll encounter the right colic and iliocolic branches, which supply the right or ascending colon and the cecum and uh, terminal ileum, respectively. If an appendix is present, the appendiceal artery typically arises from the ileocolic system. On the left side of the SMA, you'll then identify 10, 12, or 15 jejunal and ileal branches that span out and supply the several feet of small intestine. As you follow these branches out into the small bowel mesentery, you'll see that they form numerous arcades or curving branches between each other uh, that essentially unifies all those arteries into a collective supply of the small intestine. 
from these arcades then branch straight vasa recta that enter the mesenteric border of the small intestinal wall. One of the key differences between jejunum and ileum relates to the number and pattern of these arcades as well as the length of the corresponding vasa recta. We'll try and demonstrate that in our video today. As a final step, you'll then want to identify the superior mesenteric vein once again. As we've already identified it in our celiac dissection, uh, make sure you appreciate its junction with the splenic vein to form the portal vein with the inferior mesenteric vein joining in there somewhere. The superior mesenteric artery dissection can take uh, some time because of the massive distribution of that artery. You don't have to spend the rest of your life doing this, but it is a good idea to try and clean the majority of it up so you can appreciate the wide distribution and impressive nature of this uh, mesenteric vessel. Once you've had enough of the SMA, you can then move down to the hindgut vasculature, which of course will be the inferior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery also originates from the anterior midline of the abdominal aorta, but it can be difficult to palpate. To get set up for this, you'll first want to displace the small bowel on its mesentery up towards the right upper quadrant. You'll then want to identify the sigmoid colon and the sigmoid mesentery, and within that mesentery, try and find a sigmoidal branch. Uh, this is relatively easy to do. You can then follow that branch retrograde backwards until you reach the inferior mesenteric artery and its origin off the abdominal aorta. This is the easiest way I know to find the inferior mesenteric artery because it's often difficult to palpate on the aorta because it's been compressed against that structure for a lifetime. Once you've identified the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery, then begin following it antegrade. Make sure you identify the left colic artery, which supplies the left or descending colon. Identify several of the sigmoidal branches and the arcades that form between them, similar to what we saw with the superior mesenteric artery. And then the terminal branch, the superior rectal artery, that descends into the pelvis and will supply most of the uh, rectum. Don't follow the superior rectal artery into the pelvis at this time. We'll save that for our dissection of the pelvis when we have a little bit more space. And finally, you'll want to uh, appreciate the marginal artery or the artery of Drummond. This is an artery that connects the IMA distribution to the SMA distribution along the mesenteric border of the large intestine. This is an important artery clinically because the IMA often occludes during life. The distal aspect of the digestive tract maintains its perfusion through this artery of Drummond based off the SMA circulation. So it's an important clinical artery to, to find. Um, Make sure you, you appreciate that connection between the SMA and IMA circulations. And note that the splenic flexure is the watershed zone uh, relatively ischemic between the SMA and IMA distributions. Also, if you haven't already done so, make sure that you identify the inferior mesenteric vein in the left colon mesentery and follow that up to its uh, joining with the splenic and superior mesenteric veins to form the portal vein once again. And then as a last step, um, with the vasculature exposed, you can now completely study the subtle differences between jejunum and ileum in terms of their uh, mesenteric thickness, the presence or absence of mesenteric fat creeping onto the intestinal wall, and then all the all-important vascular differences in terms of number of arcades and the length of the vasa recta. So we'll go back to the cadaver now and we'll walk you through the vascular portion of the midgut and hindgut dissections. As we uh, prepare for the the midgut vasculature dissection, first thing I wanted to, to demonstrate is the origin of the superior mesenteric artery, the, the artery of the, the midgut. Uh, this is a, a difficult um, exposure 
uh, to see the, the origin of the, the SMA. And to, to show it, we're going to have to come back up to our, our previous area where we did our celiac dissections. We're going to uh, retract the liver up here. And um, right here you can see our celiac axis, at least the splenic splenic artery just to get you oriented to, to where we were before. Right here's our celiac trunk, if we can come in real close, giving off the common hepatic artery heading off to the right, and the big tortuous splenic artery heading off to the left, and here's our left gastric ascending up towards the uh, esophagus and then heading down to the lesser curvature. There's our three branches of our celiac axis, common hepatic, splenic, and left gastric. I retract that up, this vein out of the way. You can see the, the celiac trunk right here coming off the, the aorta, right, right there. I'm gonna mobilize the autonomic tissues off to the side. Just again, for, for reference sake, you can see just a little bit of it, but there's the splenic vein right there, crossing over the top of the superior mesenteric artery. Just above that, here's our pancreas. We're gonna push down, kind of mobilize out of, the, out of the way. The origin of the superior mesenteric artery is not even a centimeter distal along the aorta from the, the celiac axis. So it's, again, behind the, the pancreas and difficult to, to expose. But it's right here. And this large vessel you see right here coming off the anterior midline of the aorta. I'm going to get a clamp behind it and try and pull it up so that we can see it better. Right there's the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. Just not even a centimeter below the, the, the celiac axis. So that's where it originates and it then passes posterior to the pancreas and posterior to the splenic vein. As you see right, right here, splenic vein coming across before it merges with the SMV to become the, the portal. So now we're gonna um, mobilize the stomach upward. There's our pancreas right here, passing posterior to the pancreas would be our superior mesenteric artery. See it right, right there. We're gonna mobilize the pancreas upwards and now we can see the trunk of the, the SMA right here, again with the splenic vein coursing anterior to it. In this particular cadaver, here's the inferior mesenteric vein merging with the splenic vein before they both merge with the SMV to become our portal vein up, up here. And here's the uh, trunk of the, the superior mesenteric artery. The first branch of the SMA is difficult to expose um, and it's somewhat small and I'm going to get Charles to kind of retract the stomach as well as pancreas up here just gently. I'm going to lift up on the, the splenic vein. We've done this ahead of time but right here this little guy right here coming off the left side of the Superior mesenteric artery is the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery, which supplies, as its name suggests, the second, third portions of the duodenum as well as the, the head of the pancreas. That's the inferior pancreaticoduodenal. That's the first branch to the uh, beginning of the, the midgut mid -gut structures, it's inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery. So having seen that, now we can begin to follow the SMA here on, on camera. Just like with the celiac, the artery is going to be coated in a thick coat of, of autonomics. So right now I'm opening up the peritoneum and the root of the small bowel mesentery and encasing, coating the, the artery you see this fibrous looking tissue that, that resembles connective tissue, but these are actually autonomic nerve fibers. I don't know if we can get in close shot of that or, 
or not, this coat around the, the artery are, are dense autonomics and you have to clean those off in order to, to expose, the, expose the artery. They encircle the vessel like, like a coat. It's a little bit of a tedious job to get them worked off, but once you do, it very quickly begins to resemble an artery. And you follow that down, we're going to excise, kind of peel away that autonomic coating on the, the SMA. Be careful as you do this because that coat of autonomics makes branches somewhat difficult to, to identify. It didn't take us long and, and here coming off the left side of the artery we have our first intestinal branches. You can see one of those branches right there and just a little bit lower we found a second one right, right there. These will be jejunal branches that uh, perfuse the uh, jejunum. One of the earliest branches off the SMA will be the right colic, or the uh, middle colic artery, sorry, which remember in our visceral demonstration was, was palpated in this free edge of this window we can come back just a little bit to get the big picture here. This window that we created in the transverse mesocolon to get into the, the lesser sac in our, our previous episode. Um, that's going to be the, the middle colic artery. That will be based off of the SMA and we can probably find the origin of that as we follow the main trunk of the SMA down continuing again to open up this small bowel mesentery. And once you've got this coat of autonomics begin to, to work off, we can see several branches now coming off here on the right side. There's one, here we see a second one, and even a third and somewhat larger fourth one here. So you'll find many of, of these as, as you go. And the, the work of this dissection is, is to clean those arteries off and see how they distribute through the mesentery, their uh, territories of, of distribution. Still looking for that, that middle colic branch will find it here as, as, as we go, but the, in the, a lot of the, the work entails peeling away this autonomic coat that um, ensheathes these, these vessels. This is how the autonomics reach their target organs. So as, as we suspected, this first branch that we saw coming off the, the right that actually runs up into this free edge of our window in our transverse mesocolon, and that will be the middle colic artery. Just going to carefully try and work some of these autonomics off. At least you can see the, the initial course of that, that artery heading up into that free edge of the transverse mesocolon as we anticipated earlier. The middle colic is one of the earliest branches off the, the SMA and it can be 
missed if, you, if you're not expecting it. And you can accidentally come through it if you're not aware that that artery is going to ascend up through the transverse mesocolon and towards its target up here, the uh, transverse, transverse colon. There's our middle colic artery ver coming off the SMA very early um, as, it, as the SMA distributes through the small bowel mesentery. But for ease of uh, our, our video demonstration, I'm going to work on some of these jejunal and ileal branches. Best way to, to do this is kind of lay out a loop of jejunum and work away from, away from you. So I would anticipate these first branches we identified here on the, the left side, this one and the next one will distribute to this area of intestine. And so we're gonna clean those vessels out towards our anticipated targets, uh, kind of working away from, from ourselves and see how they distribute through this small bowel mesentery. This may take a few minutes for, for me to complete. So I'll let you sit back, watch, and, and enjoy. Uh, once we have this exposed, uh, we'll come back and, and, and walk you through the, the distribution of these, these branches. Okay, so um, after a few minutes of work, we're ready to kind of demonstrate what your, your end result should, should look like. And just for, for reference purposes, here's our, our SMA trunk. Um, as it emerges from behind the pancreas, you can see the splenic vein again crossing it right, right up in here. As we follow the SMA down, we see it start to give off lots of jejunal branches. We've cleaned those up um, out into the, the mesentery to where they, they target. And you can start to see some of the, the distinguishing features. Um, if you look at these branches as they distribute out into the, the mesentery, they start to form arcades, um, these transverse connecting uh, branches between one branch of the SMA and, and another. Here's, here's an arcade here, here's an arcade here. We go even more proximally, we can see another vascular arcade here. Then coming off of the arcades in the jejunum, you have these long straight vessels that go from the arcades into the, the intestinal wall. These are known as the vasa recta. You see the long straight vasa recta here, here, 
each of these vasa recta vessels branches directly off the, the arcades. So in the jejunum, one of the distinguishing features are long vasa recta and relatively few uh, vascular levels of, of vascular arcades. Okay. Well, we could have cleaned off more of these, these branches, but um, you can spend the rest of your life doing this if you want to. It takes a, a fair bit of time if you have it, but uh, we've, we've done enough here so that you get the, the, the idea. Um, the jejunal arcades are relatively few in number and in levels, and that gives rise to long vasa recta uh, supplying the, the intestinal wall. So if we come back to our SMA, and here's our middle colic artery um, ascending up through the transverse mesocolon to supply the transverse colon. We're gonna demonstrate some more of that uh, a bit later. So we follow the SMA down, again, some more. Um, we can see the superior mesenteric veins start to form just to the right of it. This, this structure right here. Um, we'll look at the superior mesenteric vein again at, at, at the end. But you should expect there to be anywhere from 7 to 15 of these jejunal and ileal branches, all distributing through the small bowel mesentery to the jejunum and, and ileum. We picked uh, a couple down here that, that go into the, the ileum. Um, we see a one vessel here accompanied by a vein. This is um, likely the, uh, one of the iliac or ileal branches. Then down here towards the end of the SMA, we have the ileocolic artery, um, which is heading towards the ileocecal junction. I've got the, the ileum, terminal ileum here in, in one hand and the cecum here in, in this hand. And this arterial branch that's heading towards that junction is the ileocolic artery. Um, if an appendix were present, the ileocolic artery typically gives rise to the appendiceal artery, and we would follow that into the mesentery of the appendix if, if we had one. Coming off the ileocolic artery in this individual is actually the right colic. You can see the, the branch coming off the ileocolic heading towards the right, towards our right colon here within the mesentery of the, the right colon. This set of branches right here, artery and vein, represent the right colic uh, artery as well as right colic, right colic vein. You may have a different uh, pattern in your cadaver. For instance, the right colic may directly branch off the SMA and it may be towards the, the, um, the flexure, then towards the mid portion of the colon as, as of the right segment as, as we see here. But in this particular individual, the right colic is a branch of the, the ileocolic. The ileocolic is heading towards the ileocecal junction. Then the ileal region, one of the, the, the differences is that the arcades are much more numerous in number. Uh, there's several levels of, of arcades. Unfortunately, the fat in the mesentery of the, the ileum is much denser, and so it's harder to, to clean these vessels up in a, in a short amount of time. But here we see one level of arcade here. Here we have another level of arcade here and then even some very small levels of arcades way out here as we approach the, the intestinal wall. So multiple levels of arcades which give rise to very short vasa recta. If we can come in real close right in here, we can see our kind of last level of arcade right in there and then coming off those arcades are the very short vasa recta um, supplying the ileal, ileal wall. And so that's one of the, the distinguishing features between jejunum and ileum, the number uh, and, and levels of arcades and the corresponding uh, length or, or shortness of the, the vasa recta emanating from those, those vascular arcades. Those arcades serve to provide redundancy to the blood flow of the 
of the small intestine, uh, which is quite important because this is the main organ of um, digestion of, of, or main organ for absorption of, of digested, digested nutrients. Now the last thing we'll um, look at before we move on to the um, hindgut um, vasculature is you want to take note of the superior mesenteric vein. Um, that lies to the right of the superior mesenteric artery. We can see it start to form down here as many mesenteric veins converge together and it runs along the right side of our, of our SMA and we see the, the main trunk of the SMV here. In this case, the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein converge together right in, right in here to form the portal vein. Um, the inferior mesenteric vein will join in here somewhere. It's variable. The, the IMV may join into the splenic vein as we have in this cadaver. We can't quite see it, but it's, it's right in there. Um, we'll see it better in a, in a little bit. Um, or the IMV may join at the junction, right, right in here, of the splenic and the superior mesenteric veins. Uh, but some, it'll join in there somewhere, and all three will ultimately converge together to form our large portal vein, which is way up here under the uh, pancreas, right? Right here's our, our portal vein beginning to, to form. So the superior mesenteric vein always lies to the right of the superior mesenteric artery. Make sure you take note of that and note the, the variances in formation of the, the portal vein. Welcome back after a short break. Um, we moved over to the left side to prepare for the uh, hindgut vascular dissection, specifically the inferior mesenteric artery. The IMA is one of three midline unpaired branches off the aorta that supply the various embryologic divisions of the, the gut. Um, the <coughs> IMA will distribute to the distal one-third of the colon, roughly from the splenic flexure down to, to the rectum. And it uh, derives, of course, from the lower aspect of the abdominal aorta, um, just uh, distal to the renal arteries, typically. So it can be difficult to uh, locate, but to, to get set up, you want to displace the small bowel, swing it on its mesentery over to the to the right upper quadrant. You can kind of get the idea of the, the abdominal aorta right here and, and its bifurcation into the common iliac vessels, uh, retroperitoneal um, in here. So the IMA is going to be in this uh, vicinity here, it's, it's often difficult to palpate to identify specifically where it is because it's been compressed against the aorta throughout throughout life. So the best way to find it is to locate the sigmoid colon, which will be redundant and mobile on its mesentery, the um, sigmoid mesocolon, and start looking within that sigmoid mesocolon for an arterial branch. And just to, to prepare for this, we, we've identified a small uh, sigmoidal artery right here, small vessel here. If you use that vessel, which relatively easy to find in the sigmoid mesocolon, you can begin to follow it retrograde and use that to identify the inferior mesenteric artery <clears throat> as it branches off the abdominal aorta. We'll carefully follow that, that branch retrograde. And if it's getting larger, you know you're, you're on the right, the right track. As I open up the peritoneum, you can see how that vessel has gotten progressively larger as I followed it retrograde towards the aorta. 
So we know we're on the right track. We're going to keep, keep moving proximally. And again, just like with the celiac and with the SMA, you're going to have a fairly dense coat of autonomics covering the vessel. You can see now we're in the vicinity of our previously identified um, aorta. And now we've reached the abdominal aorta. And you can see the large abdominal aorta right here with the inferior mesenteric artery uh, branching off, off of it and heading down towards the left lower quadrant. There's our, our IMA. Once you've found the, the main trunk of the IMA, start uh, progressing antegrade along the course of blood flow and try and dissect out some of its branches. The two ones that you want to identify are the most terminal branch, which is likely this one here that I'm following. This will be the superior rectal artery, which will drop down into the pelvis, and we don't want to follow it all the way to the rectum because we're going to take a look at the rectum more closely when we do our pelvic, pelvic dissection. But you can see it here descending over the, the pelvic brim into the greater pelvis. And we can follow that, that vessel um, a little bit, but we don't want to uh, study the rectum in its entirety at this, at this point. We'll look at it again closer uh, in our pelvic, pelvic dissection. But there's the superior rectal branch. We'll come back to that sigmoid branch that we initially identified, and we can probably identify several more sigmoidal branches. And again, run through that sigmoid mesocolon. And you also want to look for the most proximal branch, the left colic artery. So I'm going to come around to the other side. <clears throat> In a moment, you'll see a large branch coming off the IMA in this vicinity here. It's being crossed by a large vein that I'm going to try and protect going to be the inferior mesenteric vein. The, the left colic artery will head somewhere towards the, the left colon. In some individuals, it goes to the, the mid aspect. In some individuals, such as this one, it appears to be heading towards the splenic flexure. And we'll try and clean up some of its, some of its branches. But paralleling it, you can see the, the large vein here, the, the inferior mesenteric vein. I'm going to follow this 
left colic artery. as far as we can we're approaching the wall of the proximal part of the left colon here as we've cleaned up this arterial branch this left colic branch we're approaching the the wall of the of the colon Cadaver may have a more or less fatty mesentery, which will contribute to the amount of work that you have to do to identify these structures. There's our left colic branch of the, the inferior mesenteric heading up to the proximal part of the, the left colon here. Our splenic flexure is right in this, this vicinity here. So the, the inferior mesenteric supplies the distal one-third of the colon as well as the, um, the majority of the, the rectum via this superior rectal branch here. The rectum also is supplied by tributaries of the um, internal iliac vessels that we'll take a look at in the, the pelvis, the middle and inferior uh, rectal branches. So the distribution of the SMA, if we'll revisit that. We're gonna move our small bowel back down towards the left lower quadrant. And again, right here is our previously dissected superior mesenteric artery. We see again the jejunal uh, branches coming off toward, towards the left. We see some ileal branches uh, at its most inferior aspect. Here's our ileocolic artery here. And then we have our right, uh, sorry, this would be ileocolic, right colic branches, but the one that we want to pay attention to right now is this guy here, this uh, leftward branch, rightward branch of the superior mesenteric artery. We've cleaned it up uh, a little bit and you can see that it goes up into the transverse mesocolon on the, the right side of our, of our transverse colon here. This will be the middle colic artery. If you follow it up along that, that transverse mesocolon, um, we're going to continue to, to follow it and you'll see that it more or less parallels the course of the transverse colon. And as it does so, it gives off branches to the, the bowel wall. As we follow it along, you can see that it courses along the margin of the transverse colon. You can see that, that vessel very nicely right, right there. The distribution of the superior mesenteric artery ends again at, at roughly the, the splenic flexure. That's the terminal part of its, its uh, blood flow distribution, right in the same area where the inferior mesenteric artery via the left colic branch begins its distribution. So the, the two mesenteric arteries are connected by a very important anastomotic vessel known as the marginal artery or the, the artery of Drummond. That's this extension of the middle colic artery that will eventually anastomose with this left colic branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. So you have two different distributions, two different arterial distributions, SMA going to proximal transverse colon, IMA going to the distal transverse colon. And this area of the, the splenic flexure, unfortunately, is at the borderline between 
the two circulations and therefore is somewhat prone to ischemia because it doesn't have a dedicated vessel that supplies it but rather it's it's right in between the distributions of two two large vessels um, we in vascular terms we call that a watershed area um, a zone where um, located between the distributions of two two blood vessels two two arterial supplies and this marginal artery or the, the artery of Drummond is critical in um, supplying that that sigmoid um, sorry that um, splenic flexure region it's not uncommon at all for the inferior mesenteric artery to occlude with um, with vascular disease um, as is typical at major branch points in the arterial system those are subject to arterial occlusive disease and it's not uncommon for the the IMA to to occlude so what maintains circulation in that instance to the left colon and, and proximal half of the rectum is the superior mesenteric artery via this marginal artery of, of Drummond that we're, we're exposing um, here. So this is a, a very important anastomosis between the IMA and the SMA. The left colic branch of the IMA anastomosis with the middle colic branch of the SMA along this marginal artery of, of Drummond. In this particular case, it's actually a, a series of small, small vessels, but the, the point remains the, the same. As, as we followed, I don't know if you can see it, I haven't really done a real good job of cleaning it up, but you can follow that, that marginal artery around um, as we come through some of the fat in the, the mesentery. You can see a branch of it drop down through through here and then we can follow this all the way back to our left colic. Fairly cursory manner clean this arterial branch off. You can see that it's leading back to our inferior mesenteric vessel specifically the left left colic branch got a vein here over overlying it will cut for for clarity purposes there's that left colic branch giving off this marginal artery of Drummond that we can follow all the way around back to our middle colic artery here. So very critical in, in supplying this watershed region, the, the splenic flexure as it's positioned between the very uh, distal distributions of two major, two major mesenteric vessels, watershed area, marginal artery of Drummond is critical in supplying that 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 particular area so just as a um, sort of clinical sidebar within this mesentery not only run the arterial and supply and venous drainage of the the gut but also the autonomics as well as the lymphatics that drain drain these structures Cancer of the colon is a relatively common uh, malignancy that we see in, in America, and most colon cancers involve the left left side, sigmoid or, or left left colon. So the principal treatment for colon cancer is surgical resection, and not only does the tumor itself within the wall of the the intestine the, the bowel have to be removed. 
but the lymphatics are typically the first site of metastases and so those lymphatics have to be removed along with the bowel um, as one complete resection specimen. And so when, let's say for instance, we have a cancer located here in the sigmoid colon, it's simplistic to think that we can just remove that one little segment of colon as treatment. That, that doesn't, that's not effective. What we have to do is resect the entire distribution of the IMA because the lymphatics that drain that tumor are going to course along the vessels and any of this lymphatic tissue within the mesentery can, can be, resect, can be um, involved in, in metastatic spread. And so a relatively large resection specimen is uh, performed in order to adequately treat that cancer. We actually take the IMA right at its origin along with all this mesentery and, and its branches. And so your surgical specimen would be something like this, um, or perhaps even farther down, uh, rather than just simply taking a small segment of colon because the entire mesentery along with the IMA has to be included in one, one surgical specimen. So, Surgical resections of the colon for cancer are based on their arterial supply and often it's surprising how much uh, colon has to be removed to treat a um, cancer that's seemingly relatively localized in the, 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 the bowel wall. So the last thing we want to do um, in this dissection is, is to completely expose our inferior mesenteric uh, vein and follow it up to the, uh, its junction with the splenic and or superior mesenteric veins to form the, the, uh, the portal vein. So again, as, as you've exposed these arterial branches, it, it's very likely that you've come across uh, some venous branches. Again, particularly as you're following that left colic, you're, you're very likely to encounter the, the inferior mesenteric vein. So try and preserve it. And then as a last step, follow it up um, proximally and see if you can pick up where it drains into the either splenic vein or superior mesenteric vein or the, the junction between, between the two. We had already seen that in our celiac dissection, but we're going to go ahead and, and expose it here completely. Uh, here's our inferior mesenteric vein. We followed from the sigmoid mesocolon. See various tributaries of it coming from the, the left, left colon, one of which we had to divide an exposure of our marginal. We can follow that up and we see that it empties into our splenic vein here which is running posterior to pancreas, which we had identified earlier. There's our IMA, our IMV, and splenic vein coming together. And I don't know if we can see it with our angle. The um, splenic vein then merges with the superior mesenteric vein to form our large portal vein right, right here. The, the confluence of the IMV, splenic, and superior mesenteric veins forms the portal vein. Again, we've, we've probably said it before, but the uh, entry of the IMV is variable. It can empty into the splenic, as we see here. It can empty into the SMV, or it can come into that junction between the two. Very, very variable from, from person to, to, to person. Last thing you may want to uh, again revisit after you've completed this relatively straightforward uh, IMA dissection is to once again review the uh, distinguishing features between the proximal small bowel, the jejunum, and the distal small bowel, the, the ilium. Again, there, there's not a distinct transition point between the two, but roughly the proximal two-fifths of the 
small bowel distal to the duodenum or jejunum and the distal three-fifths are, are considered ileum. But again, the, the jejunum um, will have a very sharp distinction between the mesenteric fat and the bowel wall. You can see a very distinct, distinct line there. If we come down to the ileum, the ileum has the so-called creeping fat. The fat of the mesentery creeps onto, encroaches onto the, the small bowel wall. That creeping fat is indicative of, of ileum. The arterial supply to the jejunum, the branches, jejunal branches of the um, SMA form a limited number of, of arcades, <clears throat> anastomotic vessels between the different jejunal branches. There's relatively few arcades, which results in long, straight vessels, the long vas erecta that go into the jejunal wall. Again, if we move down a little bit farther, you can see a single arcade between two jejunal branches with long, straight vas erecta coming off that. If we come down to the ilium, because of the, the more substantial fat, uh, it's a little more difficult to see, but here's our iliocolic branch, and you can see multiple levels of, of arcades with very short vas erecta supplying the, the ileal wall. The jejunum is slightly larger in caliber, and if you palpate it, it has a, a somewhat thicker, thicker wall to it. You come down to the, the ilium, the caliber is, is a little bit smaller, and the wall doesn't feel quite as, as substantial. Now one more thing that you can do, we're not going to do it um, in our, our dissection today, but if you open up the jejunum and you look at the internal features, the transverse folds, the, the plicae circularis, are very numerous and, and prominent in the jejunum, whereas they're less frequent and less prominent in the, the ilium. We saw some of the, the plicae circularis when we opened up the duodenum back in our celiac uh, dissection, those we see these, these, these circular folds on the, the inside, the mucosa of the duodenum, those are very large and prominent in the jejunum and they become less, um, less numerous and less prominent as you get into the, the ileum. As we've hopefully demonstrated today, the midgut and hindgut dissections are fairly straightforward, but there's a couple of tricky points that we wanna uh, make, make you aware of. First, when you're mobilizing the right and left colons in the visceral component of the dissection, make sure you only incise the peritoneum lateral to those structures along what's called the white line of tolt. Uh, at that point, the right and left colons should be able to be bluntly mobilized. Uh, it does look a little neater at the end if you use some sharp techniques as well. But theoretically, the plane between the right and left colon mesenteries and the posterior abdominal wall should simply be loose connective tissue. If you need some assistance with this, uh, ask your instructor because we don't want you to bring up the gonadal vessels or the ureters or, or even the kidneys as you're mobilizing the right and left sides of the, the large intestine. On that note, uh, make sure you do identify the gonadal vessels as well as the ureter, but don't dissect them at this point. They'll be a component of our posterior wall, abdominal wall dissection in our next episode. As we move to the vascular component, if you have trouble finding the SMA uh, within the fat of the small bowel mesentery, look for the SMV first. You've already identified this usually in your celiac dissection just medial or to the left of it will be the, the SMA. Once you've identified the superior mesenteric artery, be careful as you're moving proximally. 
Uh, students often don't appreciate the three-dimensional anatomy of this region, but the uh, third part of the duodenum, as well as the left renal vein, both lie posterior to the SMA as they cross the aorta, crossing the, the midline. These are two of five structures that cross the abdominal aorta, and you don't want to transect those structures as you're uh, dissecting out the uh, trunk of the superior mesenteric artery. Similarly, the neck of the pancreas lies anterior to the superior mesenteric artery. And if you haven't done a good job of identifying the pancreas in our, your previous uh, foregut dissection, you can potentially transect that as you're cleaning up the proximal aspect of the SMA. So remember, the superior mesenteric artery lies between the pancreas, uh, neck of the pancreas, anterior to it, and in front of the third part of the duodenum, as well as the left renal vein. Uh, these structures can be compressed between the SMA and aorta in what we call the nutcracker syndrome. Also, as we've demonstrated today, as the mesenteric vessels distribute into the mesenteries, the branches become more numerous and obviously smaller. You're going to be exercise some care when cleaning these smaller mesenteric vessels so that you can appreciate the arcades and the fine vena vasa recta that enter the mesenteric aspect of the bowel wall. And finally, uh, don't follow the superior rectal artery into the pelvis at this time. We'll continue that uh, dissection as we enter the pelvis. Uh, but do identify it and note that it's the terminal branch of the inferior mesenteric artery as it completes its hindgut distribution. Have a great time with this dissection. We look forward to seeing you back in our next exciting episode.